down, um, I wanted to um, get into uh, starting to understand covenant. Um, like I said, I don't really, I don't know how preachers do the whole one hour thing. I mean, I could go on at least three hours on this topic. I'm going to have to just run through it as fast as possible. Um, and then I do plan on doing Bible study series and just going through entire um, letters. And so I just wanted to just kind of start touching base because I know some of you guys probably have no idea about anything about covenant. Um, and so, like I said, your Bible, um, you know, it starts uh, in Genesis and it goes all the way to Malachi. And that's called the Old Testament, um, also referred to as the Old Covenant. Um, really, the law doesn't even really come into play until you start reading the book of Exodus. Um, and then the New Covenant doesn't actually begin until the Ascension of Jesus and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and then we enter into the new covenant. So um, got to touch base on what was the old covenant. Um, so I'm just going to open up uh, to the book of Exodus um, and then we end up finding um, when the uh, old covenant was originally established um, in Exodus chapter 24. I'm just going to start in verse chapter or verse number six. <clears throat> and so it says, and Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Okay. And so Moses was on Mount Sinai. He went up in the Mount with God, received, you know, the 10 commandments. I'm sure you guys know the 10 commandments. And um, this was the covenant that God had made with the children of Israel. Now, this was very unique in that God um, previously in human history had never made a covenant um, with any nation on the face of the earth. This was very exclusive to the Jews. And so, um, and the law, like I said, it consists like 613 or 633 laws. But, you know, the Ten Commandments being, you know, the chief um, commandments. And the people said, you know, we will do this. You've got the blood sprinkled. Like I said, part of, part of covenant, um, there's three different types of covenants. But, you know, this was um, a blood covenant. And so um, anytime that you've got a covenant, there's always blood. You can even think of marriage. Um, and not to be too graphic, but even in marriage, you know, when a man is espoused to a virgin... Okay, and then there's, you know, that deflowering of his virgin, you know, there is, you know, um, yeah, there, bas there is blood involved. And so that is actually a form of, of that is a picture of blood covenant. Um, and I, yeah, I don't want to get too graphic into it. But so that was the old covenant. And um, like I said, it carried on over even until, uh, you know, the, the days of Jesus. And so... I just wanted to um, keep this in mind, all right, because this is going to be very important for what we're going to be getting into, all right. Now, when Moses went up, you know, for 40 days, you know, with God, um, and this was, you know, when he went to receive, you know, the Ten Commandments or whatever, the children of Israel ended up, uh, you might you might have heard, you know, mention of the golden calf. I'm not going to read the entire story. I'm just going to tell you what happened. Um, Moses comes back down and, um, you know, the people basically thought like Moses isn't coming back. I mean, 40 days is a long time. That's literally, you know, a, that's an entire month and a week and, you know, three or four days after that as well. So that's a very long time for somebody to be gone, you know, hanging out with God. And so they literally, you know, ended up throwing some of the gold that they had gotten from the Egyptians because the Egyptians ended up giving them gold on their way out, um, you know on their exodus or on their exit out of out of uh, Egypt. That's why the book of Exodus is called Exodus, if you guys didn't know that. And so uh, they ended up, you know, and it ends up, you know, forming a calf, you know, of gold, and they start worshiping it. And then when Moses comes down, you know, he breaks, you know, he breaks the, the Ten Commandments, and it's just, you know, the, the two stones where the, the, the commandments were written on, you know, because they had already broken the Ten Commandments, you know, because one of the commandments is you will have no idols, you know, you will not build yourself, you know, any idols of gold and silver, you're not going to worship any other god, and they went to worshiping other gods, 
right, you know, literally like 40 days into, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, having this encounter with God, they're already breaking the law. Um, anyways, all right, so we're going to, um, honestly, everything, everything that you're going to learn, um, well, the majority of what you're going to learn about the new covenant is really going to be found in the book of Hebrews, which is, like I said, one of my favorite books in the Bible because I've ended up learning more about covenant out of this one book. Because, you know, the Last Supper, you know, when Jesus was with his disciples, you know, said, you know, and they and they broke bread and, you know, drank of the wine and, you know, Jesus was like, this is the blood of the new covenant. Okay, like, he didn't make a covenant with them, you know. There was no shedding of blood. There was no... They didn't take oaths and promises and all of these other things. And so understanding the old covenant and the, the new covenant is so important because we're in the new covenant. And if you don't understand that, then you're not going to be able to walk in the new covenant and know what it is. Um, so I'm just going to share with you, uh, just I'm going to run through some passages real quick and I'm going to string them together. I can't, I can't go through the entire book in one video that's just not possible and give commentary on it. It would take way too long. Um, all right, so I'm going to start Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. All right, so it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, okay, humans, it says he himself likewise, it's talking about Jesus, shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Okay, that's a very important scripture. As a believer, you might want to write that one down because you'll probably be using it, you know, um, in your prayer life. Anytime that you experience fear, you can go to this scripture and just remind yourself um, that Jesus has set us free from the bondage of the fear of death. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Okay, so it says, For indeed... He does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, okay? Therefore, in all in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted, okay? All right, so Jesus was made a human being like us all right he had to use the bathroom he had to grow up he had to take showers he, he got hungry he got thirsty he had emotions reading the bible he got angry he he cried you know he even experienced nervousness in the garden of gethsemane you know he he, he made supplications and, and prayers with great crying i mean he he even asked the father you know lord if there be any other way you know for this pass to you know for this cup to pass over me like you know, take it away, nevertheless, you know, not my will, but your will be done. So he experienced all human emotions. So we're not talking about, you know, an angel or, you know, God who is not able to be touched with our infirmities, but Jesus understands our weakness. Jesus went through everything that you could possibly imagine, betrayal, friendship, love, pain, death, loss. I mean, you know, injustice, he's experienced it all. So he knows what we are going through in this lifetime. All right, Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, let's just do verses 1 through 10 here real quick. Okay, so it says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. This is talking about the Levitical priesthood, people that were made priests, you know, they were the sons of Levi, and, you know, these were, these were men, you know, they, they, they had like passions just like us, and so they understood, they could relate to the people, okay, it says, because, uh, because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins, and no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called of God, just as Aaron was, so, this was not like, you know, democracy, you know, where you can just vote like, hey, I want to be a priest. You were, this was something that you were born into, the sons of Levi. This was something that was passed down from father to son, okay? And it says, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was said to him, 
You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, okay, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, and Melchizedek, I mean, this is a very long teaching, but in Genesis, Melchizedek, okay, he was a, he was, he was the priest of the most high God, you know, by interpretation of his name, king of righteousness, you know, uh, king of Salem, king of peace, okay, he was made like unto the son of God. All right, but he had no beginning of days nor end of life, so he was, um, he was one of the, he's a very mysterious character, but let's just, I mean, I'm just going to tell you he was basically the priest of God, okay, and mind you that God didn't really need a priest, you know, but because, you know, since be the beginning of the foundations of the earth, before God even made the earth, he knew the fall of man. He knew Satan was going to come. He knew there was going to be an old covenant. He knew there was going to be a new covenant. So he had already planned all of this out, you know, before man even came into the world. That's why it says that that the works the, the works of salvation that was already done since before the foundation of the world. Okay, I know this is, it's hard for our carnal minds to understand these things, but if you were God and all-knowing and knew everything from beginning and end, you would also understand why these things were necessary. So I'm going to jump to Hebrews chapter 7, and let's just go to verse 11 real quick. Um, let's see here. It says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, okay, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Okay. I'm just going to read this entire chapter. All right, so it says, For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord Jesus arose from Judah. Okay, there were 12 tribes of Israel. The priest came from Levi. Moses wrote about this. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. That's why one of his names is the lion from the tribe of Judah. It says, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshy commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, okay, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, okay, for on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and an unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Okay? It says, And inasmuch as he was not made a priest without an oath, okay, for they have become priests without an oath, but he was an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, okay? By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant, all right? Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus is alive forevermore. He has conquered the grave, therefore he now lives forever, okay? Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. If you guys go through the old covenant, you end up realizing, and it's kind of similar to like the way our presidency works, but look, every high priest was not perfect. And really, when you had a high priest that was awesome and was doing great, you know, and was being faithful and not like living super sinful, you know, things were going great you know, for, you know, for the entire, you know, for the entire population, you know, the children of Israel were walking in blessing. It was awesome. But you read stories about how, 
uh, not all of the, not all of the priests, you know, were so great. I mean, you got some really bad twisted priests, you know, they were getting drunk, you know, they were, you know, just committing all types of, you know, sexual sin and just, you know, living wrong and living, you know, you know, in hypocrisy. And when they ended up rebelling against, you know, the commandments of God, things went terrible for the people. And so there was a direct correlation, you know, how your leader was performing ended up directly affecting how the people were doing. Okay, so it says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for, for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Jesus has become perfect forever. He's never going to sin again. He's never, I mean, he never sinned at the beginning, but now it's impossible for him to sin, okay? He is never going to die. He is going to be holy and perfect for the rest of all of eternity. And this, he has now become a high priest. And so, like I said, this is what the scripture says, that this is why he's able to save us to the uttermost, because he lives forever to make intercession. He's not like the carnal earthly priest, the priest of Levi, that if you had a good priest, just like if you had a good president, you know, this is awesome. But hey, one of these days, you know, the president or the priest is going to die. And we don't know who's going to be the next one after him, you know, in his office. He might be really crappy. He might lead the country, you know, downhill. You know, it, it's just like a gamble. You don't know what you're going to get. But with Jesus, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we know what we're going to get. We're going to get a high priest that is holy and perfect and separate from sinners. And he is going to be the righteousness of God. And he has made unto us wisdom. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get into preaching here. Okay, I need to get back into the word. Hebrews chapter 8. Let's go from verses 6 to 13 real quick. All right, so it says in verse number 6. Let's see here. It says, but now, okay, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So go find out what the promises and the blessings are. Hey, Deuteronomy chapter 28, that's a good place to find blessing and cursing. Find all those blessings. Realize that all of those promises, according to Second Corinthians, are yes and amen. And apparently, we have a better covenant built off of better promises and a more sure word of prophecy, according to the Apostle Peter. Okay, so, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, okay, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, okay, this is God speaking, The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, uh, after those days say the Lord. This is important. This is part of the new covenant, all right? I will put my laws in their mind, okay, and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now you got to keep in mind in context when this letter was written to the Hebrews, all right, the ceremonial uh, sacrifices, sacrifices, the Levitical priesthood was still going on. And so now we know, I mean, the temple has been destroyed right now. Even the Jews, even the Jews can't keep the old covenant because 
they don't even have the temple and i mean the law is very very specific um you know the way things are set up i mean they can still keep you know the feast days and the sabbath days and certain celebrations but in terms of i mean they are not even doing the right blood sacrifices which like I said the old covenant is done away with okay it's been made obsolete by the new covenant um and so like i said i don't even really know what the orthodox jews are doing right now because it is impossible for them to keep the law because they don't have the temple to do all of the temple priesthood duties plus i mean it's it's a really that's a whole another teaching why they can't even they they couldn't even try to keep the old covenant even if they tried because they don't have everything they need plus you know the bloodline and and the anyways it's it's an endless genealogy i can't get into it right now um so uh we're gonna go uh hebrews chapter 9 and let's start in verse 13 um let's see here so it says for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is such an important verse. I mean, this is such an important verse. I'm going to read, I really want to read just the, the, the remainder of this entire passage. Um, but according to scripture, which I mean, I can testify, I can just go ahead and tell you this is true because... I've taken this scripture, in fact, I've experienced the reality of the scripture before even having read it, and I can tell you that the blood of Jesus literally cleanses your conscience and gives you the ability, having taken guilt away from you, to, to, to serve and to walk in newness of life. Okay, it says, And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Okay, so all of the sins that were committed under the first covenant. Okay, all the sins God said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Okay, all of those sins have been placed on the body of Jesus Christ. And those sins have been condemned in the flesh, according to the book of Romans. All right, and the righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. I know this is heavy and this is a lot. Okay, it says for... Where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. This is a very important important passage. I'll explain it to you in a second. I'm going to read it and then I'll explain it if you don't understand it. Okay. For a testament is in force after men are dead. It's pretty self-explanatory. Think of, you know, the will of your mother, father, grandmother, aunt, or uncle. Okay. You write out your will. All right. It doesn't go into effect until somebody dies. Okay. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So there had to be death in the old covenant for their, the enforcement of the law to even take place. For it to start, there had to be the death. And they were using animal sacrifices, which was a picture of the Lamb of God, who was the more excellent, perfect sacrifice of the more perfect and heavenly uh, promises. Okay, so... For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. I read that to you in, in Exodus chapter 24, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Okay? It says, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the most holy place every year with the blood of another, okay, in the Old Covenant, the high priest, they only entered into the holy place one time a year, okay? This is the Day of Atonement, you know? Okay, and it says, He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, okay, but after this judgment, which, by the way, this is why the Bible teaches against reincarnation. It's another teaching. I won't get into it right now. So Christ was offered once 
to bear the sins of many. He technically died for all, but not all are going to receive him. That's just the way it is. Okay, to those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Okay, and then lastly, I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 10, 14, and then I'm going to give a little bit of commentary over the passages that I've read so you guys can get some understanding of what happened. Because when I understood this, it was like, like the biggest eureka moment ever. Okay, so Hebrews 10, 14, just one of my, I mean, the whole book, I, I mean, this whole I listen to the book of Hebrews constantly. It's literally, it, it's one of the most beautifully written letters. I mean, even Greek scholars will tell you it was written excellently. That's why I think Paul wrote it. I mean, I could, that's another teaching. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Uh, let's see here. It says, For by one offering, he, Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, say the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart and in their mind, and I will write them. And he adds, Their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Okay, I want you guys to understand this, alright? If you read in the book of Exodus, alright, if you continue reading on, all right, so the children of Israel, they're provoking God, you know, to wrath. I mean, they they didn't just, man, it's sad. Now, the children of Israel are a picture of the church, so we can't really bash them because the reality is is that we are literally the children of Israel. We are just as carnal as they were. We're guilty of all the same stuff. I mean, here you've got, you know... God, you know, supernaturally delivers them from Egypt, which is, which is a picture of sin. And then, you know, he leads them out, you know, parts the Red Sea. That's a picture of baptism, you know, delivers them from all their enemies. This is a picture of deliverance, you know, demons getting cast out of you. You're being set free. And, you know, on top of that, you know, he makes it rain manna from heaven. Okay. Uh, and this isn't a fairy tale. Like I said, these, these stories... Okay, Jews passed them down from, from generation to generation. They actually picked up stones when they were walking across the Dead Sea. You know, they picked up stones specifically so they could show their children and their children's children, like, hey, look, these are the stones. Like, we were we were the ones, you know. A lot of stuff in, in, in Jewish custom was passed down verbally, and they actually had these stones to say, hey, look, okay, this is, we're, we're, we didn't just make this stuff up. Like, we were literally in bondage, you know. This is all historical historical you know we were in egypt we walked through the red sea here are the rocks we picked up rocks to prove like we were there you know and um like i know obviously now nobody is physically alive i mean it's like the holocaust some people deny the holocaust happened but there's people that are like no i was there i witnessed it what are you talking about it didn't happen you know and so this is just historical stuff and so all right so it rains manna from heaven and, you know, next thing you know, they're complaining, oh, you know, we're tired of eating the same thing. And then they're like, oh, we're thirsty. You know, they're always complaining and murmuring and just provoking God to wrath. And it's just like, God's just like, look, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, a pillar of fire and a, and a, and a cloud, you know, uh, in the daytime, you know, I'm following you guys around. I'm giving you all this provision, you know, I'm producing, you know, water out of a rock for you guys. And he's doing all these supernatural things, and yet they're still doubting and not believing God, and still murmuring and complaining and shaking their fist at God, and, and saying, you know, hey, we would have been better off in Egypt, just like people today, you know, get set free by the power of Christ, and they're just like, they're complaining, and they're wanting to go back into sin, they're wanting to go live like the rest of the world, like, we're all guilty, okay, so it's not that they, we're better than them, okay, honestly, we're supposed to learn from them, Paul actually says that everything that was written was written um, as an example, so that basically we don't fall into the same mistakes that they did. I mean, they committed fornication as soon as the law was given, and literally, like, 3,000 of them died, okay? And this was supposed to show us, like, hey, look, sin is for real, sin is serious, uh, fornication. I mean, when you read the warnings of Paul, sexual sin is always at the top of the list. Why? Because it's going to be literally one of the most number one sins that we fall into, okay? And so... What I wanted to say is this, all right? So at one point, God's like, look, I'm sick of this. You know, I'm about ready to say I'm done with this. 
Moses, look, you're faithful. I'm cool with you. It can just be you and me. We can start over fresh. I'm just, look, I can wipe them out. They're obviously, you know, they're rebellious. They're stubborn. They're stiff-necked. You know, they're disobedient. They're complaining. They're murmuring. They are not, they're ungrateful. You know, they, they have no interest in me. They want to go serve other gods. Why don't we just, you know, do away with them and start over fresh? And Moses, as an intercessor, said, no, look, um, if they go, I go. You know, if you want to destroy them, destroy me too. And, you know, and for the sake of Moses, thank God that Moses stood up. And I, I know that God knew what Moses, you know, God, it's not like, you know, God, God chose Moses for a reason. You know, this was a picture of Christ, you know, that, that he would, you know, bridge the gap, you know, and, and act, you know, as an intercessor to save the people. And so God, the Holy Ghost, you know, was trying to show us something, you know, within Moses, you know, that was reflected of the character of Christ and, you know, Christ's role, you know, as a, as a, as a mediator. And so here's the thing. How many of you guys understand how covenant works? How do you get out of covenant? All right. Paul explains this. All right. If you read in the book of Romans, he talks about, he uses marriage as an illustration. All right. So if a man marries a woman, all right, they're married. She can't go legally go marry another dude. Okay, or she'll be in adultery or I guess bigamy. Anyways, it's just illegal. You know, you can't do that. You're breaking your covenant. Now, if your husband dies, then you are set free of that law and you are free to go marry. And if you marry another, you are not in adultery. You're Scott. You know, it's free. You're you're you have you have that legal right. Okay, so God, think about this. God made a covenant with the children of Israel, the entire nation. So here's the thing. There's only one way out. I mean, there's two ways out, but really there was only one way out, but God made another way. Okay, so he had to either A, die, which because God is immortal and it is not possible for God to die, okay? Either he had to die to set himself free of, you know, the covenant, which, I mean, if God died, you know, we would all cease to exist. I mean, the fa the fabric of the universe, the heavens and the earth and this, the natural realm and the spirit realm would all collapse and everything would cease to exist. But, so either he would have to die to set himself free of this or he would have to destroy the entire nation, okay? And so we see that the Jews are still alive. So obviously the latter end was not the method in which that he decided to take upon the end of this covenant. And so instead, this is what he did. All right. So in order to set himself free of this covenant, he became like human beings. He became like flesh and he himself was made into a mortal. And so like, I mean, this is a whole nother teaching, you know, is Jesus God? I will have to do a separate teaching. I mean, the short answer is yes. But there, I mean, I, it's, there's, there, I'd have to give you scripture after scripture after scripture to demonstrate and prove this, um, scripturally at least, you know, I know that nobody can believe it unless you receive it divinely from the father. But what I'm saying is, is that, all right, when Jesus died, that is when the old covenant was done away with, because you remember when Jesus, you know, the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and he went down and stooped down and he started writing on the sand you know, he started writing out and it, it was convicting their hearts, you know, and everybody start, started dropping their stones. You know, that was when Jesus said, you know, he let he that is without sin cast first stone. Okay, so he was he was showing he was the one that wrote the Ten Commandments. All right. That was Jesus. And so what I'm saying is, is that by his death, that is what put the end of the old covenant to rest. He loosed himself. From that binding covenant that he originally made. Now, here's the thing. Okay, Jesus, first of all, he made he made an end to the covenant through his death. And then here's the second part. All right, look, God did not make a covenant with mankind. All right, just like he made originally, he made God made a covenant with the children of Israel. Okay. That was the old covenant. Now, the new covenant, all right, was made by Jesus as a man, okay, 
for all of mankind with God the Father. All right. So in the Old Covenant, if you go read, remember how I read to you and the people said, all right, everything that you wrote, we're going to obey it. All right. And then if you go and you read Deuteronomy 28, all right, you have the blessings and the cursings. The blessings are all dependent upon the obedience of the people. Now, how many of you guys know that we are sinners? Okay, we are imperfect. We cannot keep the law perfectly, which is, this is the reason why. I know some of you guys get upset and they're like, okay, well, all this bad stuff happens in the Old Covenant. God's this angry, mean God, you know. Listen, God is holy and he made a covenant. This is a whole nother teaching. I could really get into how... God wanted to make them all priests. He wanted to have direct relationship with all of the people. The people rejected that. And I can show you that in scripture. That they said, no, look, we we are afraid of God. Look, Moses, you can, you can go for us. And then God had to institute the Levitical priesthood. But originally, he wanted to make the children of Israel a kingdom of priests. He wanted all of them to have direct fellowship. See, the Holy Spirit only came upon the judges, came upon... The kings came upon the prophets and came upon the priests, all right, in the Old Covenant. And God directly spoke to the spirits of the prophets in the Old Covenant. But originally, God wanted to have a relationship with every single one of the people that were within the covenant. They rejected that. They said, no, we don't want that. And instead, give us the law and we will obey it. That's They, they made that binding agreement and as a result, God's like, okay, well, you want to obey the covenant? You want to you wanna obey the law? All right, fine. Here's, here's the law. And gave them the law, and they were like, all right, we'll listen. We'll obey. And God's like, okay, well, you said it, so now I'm going to keep my word. You guys are going to keep your word. He pronounces blessing and cursing, and every single time that they disobeyed, God is holy. And if God did not, if God overlooked that, then God would be a liar. God would be unjust. He had to follow his own covenant. And so that's why there was blessing and cursing because it was dependent upon the obedience of humans. Uh, well, specifically, you know, the Israelites. And so now the new covenant was not made, okay, by the human race and God uh, or the children of Israel and God. The new covenant was made with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father now, the significance of this is that now the, the blessing is not dependent upon our obedience or disobedience. It is based upon the obedience of Christ, okay? And so that is why all the promises are yes and amen in Christ because he has fulfilled the law already, okay? So his, the inheritance is his. He ceased from his works. He sat down from his works. All the blessings are his now. He's already obtained them. He's already earned them eternal life. Look, like I said, if we would have theoretically kept the law perfectly, which was impossible, we would have won for ourselves eternal life. Yet none of us could do this, but Christ did this for us. And then he took all of the sins that were committed under the Old Covenant, the, uh, the Old Testament, he took all of those trespasses and by his death, all right, he fulfilled the righteous law that it would be fulfilled within us, okay, through the spirit. And that's why he gives you his spirit. And so now all of the blessings in Christ are yes and amen because they are dependent upon the obedience of Christ, okay, not your obedience. You cannot ruin it, okay. It's his covenant with the Father, now, the question isn't, do I have a covenant with God? The question is, are you in Christ? Okay, because when you are in Christ, you inherit all the blessings by faith, through grace. It's not by your own obedience. It's not by your own self-righteousness. That's why Paul preached the gospel of grace, that by the works of the law, that no man would be justified. Look, we don't deserve we don't deserve the Holy Spirit. We don't we don't deserve the blessing of the Lord. We don't deserve, you know, uh, the promises, uh, you know, all the promises that the Word of God says that we can have. We don't deserve a single one of them. We all fall short of the glory of God. But blessed be to the Lord Jesus Christ, who for on the behalf of all of mankind, he has achieved and he has conquered and he has acquired all the blessings and all the promises. He's made a covenant with God. And so... 
It's his covenant, and so we enter in by entering into him. He is the ark, okay? We enter in, and we are safe from judgment, but we need to abide in the ark. We, okay, we need to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Let's not jump out of the ark, and let us learn to live how to, how to submit to the will of God and how to submit to the Spirit and walk in righteousness, and let's not step outside of Christ so that that umbrella, that hedge of protection and that provision, that we don't end up getting outside of the will of God because who knows that God will still protect you, but there's only a certain extent to where if you want to, if you want to sinfully, if you want to willfully sin, I mean, the Bible makes it very clear that if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, that there is no longer, you know, a sacrifice for sin and just, you know, an expectation of judgment because, you know, the Bible says that, you know, the law of Moses, anybody who despised the law of Moses, you know, uh, you know, two or three witnesses that you know you were you were condemned but he says you know how much how much sore punishment do you think that those you know that trodden underfoot the son of god and, and and count you know his sacrifice to be a common thing how much sore punishment do you think that they deserve those that have outraged the spirit of grace because god has given to you all these things freely look i mean jesus paid a very high price a very high price and i know that a lot of you guys don't understand this but once you understand this, honestly, it should it should provoke it should provoke your heart to a type of brokenness. I remember after I received the Holy Spirit, that literally, I mean, He said, "I take your heart of stone, and give your heart of flesh," and He's going to write His laws on my heart. Okay, He took my heart of stone because, like I said, my heart of stone. I mean, it couldn't really respond to the things of God. But now that He's given me a heart of flesh, I'm telling you that as soon as that Holy Spirit entered me. All of a sudden, sin broke my heart. You know, I felt immediately repentant of, you know, everything that I did. I felt such deep remorse that just literally, you know, I mean, I've been in tears, you know, in repentance. And you can't do that with a heart of stone. Like I said, I was so proud and haughty and arrogant that, you know, with my heart of stone, I couldn't even shed a tear for 9-11. You know, I was just full of darkness and the most incompassionate person. But once you understand what God has done for us and the, the, the lengths that he has gone, and not only has he been, like I said, the sacrifice, you know, he was the sacrifice, but now he's also the high priest that lives forever to intercede for you. And that's why he's able to save you to the uttermost. And if you don't understand what he did, like I said, I made a teaching on what, you know, what happened when Jesus died. Not only that, like I said, he's got the keys of death and hell, you know, and he, that, this is the reason why he has the ability to give people eternal life. And that is what the promise is. The promise is eternal life. He is eternal life. He is the resurrection. And once you understand that all of your sin, okay, all of your sin has been condemned in his flesh and that the blood of Jesus, it, it cleanses you of all unrighteousness and the sprinkling of the blood, it cleanses you from a guilty conscience so that you don't have to live in remorse. You don't have to live in guilt. I'm telling you, if you're in guilt and remorse, you know, for the sins that you've committed, assuming that you've turned away and you've asked God to forgive you, you are not applying the blood of Jesus if you're still living in re regret and guilt. Because according to the Bible, it says that he will remember your sins no more. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that he heaps no records of wrong. And so once those things are done away with, he says that... All things, you know, have passed away. Behold, all things are new, all right? If you have become a new creation in Christ, you have to understand where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You have been set free of those things. And that's why he says, now, brethren, we can enter boldly into the, you know, into the, the, the throne room, you know, and, and approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and, and grace in time of need, which, like I said, we're always in a time of need, so we can just live in the presence of God. We can enter in. We've The veil has been torn through his flesh, and now we have been, been granted access by the same Spirit to the Father. That's why we have direct fellowship with him, and we have become the temples of the Most High God. And the most holy place, our heart, Christ has entered in. He has entered into heaven, but he has also entered into the heart of man. And so now that that veil has been removed, you know, the Bible says that, According to 2 Corinthians, that if any man cannot, you know, does not believe in the gospel, does not believe in the good news, it's because Satan has placed a veil over his heart. In fact, Paul also explains that 
You know, when the law of Moses is read to this day to the Jews, okay, there is a veil over their hearts, okay? A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Read Romans chapter 11, okay? But Christ is the one that removes the veil. That's why he said in, in Ephesians, you know, that I pray that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your heart being enlightened, that you might understand what is the height and the depth and the length and the breadth to know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Because when you receive the love of Christ and when you experience the love of Christ, I'm telling you, it does, it, it produces life in you. It will draw you to tears how good and how gracious the love of God is. If there is sin in your life, it will break you and cause you to repent. And if you are living righteously, the presence of God just makes you a puddle, a pool on the floor. And all you can do is just bask in his glory and just say, hallelujah, praise you, Lord. I thank you. Thank you, Lord God. I mean, I've had snot running down my nose, tears, you know, flooding out of my eyes just because the presence of God is so thick and his atmosphere is so good. And you know what? You can't experience that unless you get into his presence and honestly, you know, God and sin, they cannot commingle together. That's when Adam and Eve, they, that's why when they sinned, they lost the spirit. That's why the eternal life left. That's why in the Old Covenant, you know, you had the Holy Spirit come and go. But that's one of the beautiful things is that because the New Covenant is not dependent upon our obedience and it's dependent upon the obedience of Christ, okay, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave. That's why the Holy Spirit left Jesus on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, that is because the Holy Spirit left Jesus, okay, on the cross, and he, he experienced abandonment, okay? He did that so that in the new covenant, you won't ever have to experience abandonment. I mean, I'm not suggesting this, but it doesn't matter how bad you screw up. It doesn't matter if you're backslidden. It doesn't matter if you sin. I mean, it does matter. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but what I'm saying is, is that even despite all of these things, the Holy Spirit is not going to leave you. That's why the Bible says, grieve not the Spirit, because the Spirit still remains in you, okay? He doesn't leave you. And like I said, the Holy Spirit can be with you all the way till you give your last breath. And if you want to rebel against God and live sinfully and go astray and, you know, be an apostate, you know, he'll be with you until, like I said, you end up, you know, sentencing yourself to hell. This is what I was telling my kids that, you know, God has given us essentially a free ticket to heaven. Now, you can throw away the ticket. I, I've got to do a teaching on, you know, are we saved by faith or works? And the truth is we're saved by faith through grace, you know, and we need to produce fruit in our lives. But like I said, no, you do not earn the Holy Spirit. That's what he, Paul said in Galatians. He said, I have one thing to ask. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Answer. And the answer is simple. No, it was by the hearing of faith. And so, like I said, it has nothing to do with your goodness. It has everything to do with his goodness. And when the spirit of grace has entered upon you, it will teach you to deny ungodliness. And it will teach you, like I said, he'll write his laws on your heart and your mind. Look, it is easier for me to obey God than it is to disobey God. Okay, it is harder. It's the opposite for the children of the devil. It is easier to sin than it is to do the right thing. I mean, unless you're just like very, very, very sensitive conscience. But... It, even if, if, if you are in that place, if you're a child of the devil, if you have never received Christ and you don't have the Holy Spirit and it's difficult for you to sin and you've got a very sensitive conscience, I'm telling you, you are a perfect candidate for the kingdom of God because when the Holy Spirit comes in you, walking in righteousness and walking in purity and walking in holiness is going to come very natural to you. Like I said, some people are very blessed in that arena, you know, but some people are like not. And I'm, I was one of the bad eggs, honestly. And, you know, I spoiled... You know, I, I spoiled the whole bunch, you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And I was very cancerous to a lot of people, you know, uh, leading them astray, you know, you know, encouraging them, you know, to sin, you know, wanting to surround myself with people that were wanting to engage in the same sinful behaviors that I was, you know, a partaker in. But we don't have to live that way anymore. God doesn't want us to live those lives because those things, the Bible makes it very clear that God is not mocked. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption, okay? And some of us have just not woken up because the Bible says that there's pleasure in sin for a season. But I'm telling you, especially if, for those of you that have children, when you start to see the same sins that destroyed you, the same battles that you didn't overcome, when you start watching those battles start destroying your kids, and when you start watching the same thing that defeated you defeat them, 
you are going to cry out to God and you are going to be grieved, okay? But the power of the gospel is this, that you can overcome those things. You can train up your children and you can teach them how to approach the kingdom of darkness and how victory in Christ can overcome every and any obstacle. It does not matter. Like I said, God has given you the power. He wants to live inside of you and live through you and destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus was, was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And so when he lives in you, first and foremost, you need to destroy the devil, the works of the devil within you, first and foremost. All the battles that you're going through, look, you can overcome them. You can overcome them by the power of the word, by the blood of Jesus. It says that he cleanses our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. We can walk in purity and holiness. The Bible wouldn't say that we can do something that we can't, okay? Christ wouldn't tell us to do something if he wasn't going to give us the power to do it. And that's the good news of the gospel. This is something that religion is going to offer you the power. Religion is going to give you the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, do's and don'ts, okay? But Christ gives you life. Christ gives you life. He is the spirit of life. And the Bible says that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death, okay? He has come to destroy the works of the devil in your life. And I'm not saying that he came to set you free of trials and tribulations. There's a false gospel that's going around that basically says that if you believe in Jesus, he's going to take all your problems away. No, he's going to give you the power and the grace to overcome your problems by righteousness. He's going to give you patience to overcome and to endure your hardships and your storms. The Bible says that all that want to live godly are going to suffer persecution. And so there are promises of tribulation. There are promises of suffering. There are promises of persecution. Okay? God didn't come to set you free of those things. All right? Like I said, he came to be that fourth man in the fire. He said the storm's going to come, but your house isn't going to be destroyed if you will listen to what he says. So when the Spirit of God has come into you, get a hunger and a thirst. And if you don't have, this is a prayer that God will respond. Ask the Lord, Lord, give me a hunger and a thirst and a passion for praise, for worship, for studying your word. Because the spirit within you is willing. The flesh is weak, but the flesh profits nothing. And I'm telling you, those that belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and its sinful nature. So I pray that this video has given you understanding. And you understand a little bit better who you are in Christ and what you have in the new covenant. The old covenant has been done away with. Understand what Jesus Christ has done for us and walk in the power and the victory that he's provided. Have a good day, a good morning, good evening. God bless.